um, when you think about education in India and in most emerging markets, sadly, it's hard not to think about test scores. You know, growing up, the benzene ring and its many moods, I just found them super high maintenance. So I decided to have a love affair with physics instead. Turns out the Indian exam system didn't agree with my choices. So what happened was, I ended up in a situation where what I enjoyed learning, I couldn't give enough time to, and I kind of lost the plot on the stuff that I actually didn't enjoy learning. I could not bring myself to love learning everything, but everything was part of the syllabus. It got me thinking, what does it take to actually balance the love of learning what you really want to learn, and at the same time, not lose the plot on the stuff you don't want to see for dinner? What tools could be created to balance learning with scoring in a system where grade-based learning over many, many years eventually translates into a three-hour exam that determines your access to college? Turns out there are two powerful ideas, actually revolutionary ideas, which are driven by data and eventually ended up becoming driven by AI that can change the status quo forever and help every student in the world balance learning with scoring. The first idea is to do with the concept of learning. So, you know, three years ago, I was in a classroom, and I overheard a conversation between a student and a teacher. So the student, very wide-eyed, happy person, went to the teacher and asked a question. And the teacher basically dismissed him with a wave of his hand, admonished him, saying, you should not have this question at this time of preparation in your exam. If you don't know the answer to this question, you might as well give up. You should have come to me sooner. It got me thinking. What did sooner mean? And I couldn't get the face of that student out of my head. It was so crestfallen. So I resolved to start digging. What is sooner? The answers, as we unraveled that string, became more and more exciting as time passed over the last five years of building and buying. So everybody knows that learning layers on itself, right? So we know that you start in grade one, then two, then three, then four, and then you keep passing your grade, and you get exactly one year to master the concepts in that year. And then, you know, you take an exam, there's a 35% pass mark, and you go to the next year. And we all know that familiar sigh of relief that, thank God, seventh grade is done, right? Turns out, it's never really done. It sneaks up on you when you least expect it. You just don't know it. Think about the 35% pass mark. Was that really assessed properly? And what is in the 65% that's going to rear its ugly head later on? We had to figure out the answer to that. Basically, over multiple years of learning, there is a continuum of concepts building on each other. And the learning data that we generate is extremely valuable. But today, there is no way to access that gap when you most need it. There is no way to go back to that information and see it again. And that is why that student looked crestfallen, because he had hit a wall. He had no way to respond to his teacher's feedback, so he decided to react to it instead and got demotivated. But what if he could trace a path? What if he could actually go back and see where the gap is? So as part of our resolve to dig, we said, you know what, let's start with the 12th grade and start breaking it down. So we went after an atomized deconstruction of the syllabus and said, how do these concepts actually link to each other, that if a student displays a weakness in one concept, you can actually trace the path back to where the problem started? How do these concepts connect across grades? How do these concepts connect across subjects? Do they even connect across subjects? The funniest thing that we came across was that biology actually connects to math. So those of you who choose bio because you don't like math, there is a problem. Okay? Um, and we also wanted to see which concepts are the most fundamental to learning, which concepts are the most important for testing. What does this graph really look like? Now, one of the most interesting things was that everybody understands that learning gets more complex as time passes. But what we saw amazed us. This was not like the proverbial foundation, walls, and roof. This is actually so many circular loops and references. There is a concept of time which is introduced in the first grade. It's exactly used in the same way in the 11th grade, because mechanics uses it to calculate speed and velocity. So if you think about it, the entire graph turns on itself. Higher grade English grammar has notions like big, bigger, biggest, which is comparative and superlative in grammar. Did you know that's the first thing that grade one math covers in the first chapter? The child is taught big, bigger, biggest. The other very interesting thing was that the deeper that you got 
and you saw the to and fro motion and you saw the circular references, the more curious we got that are there actually paths that can unravel the blockages through these years? So we did something insane. We said, not only are we going to connect these concepts, we're actually going to take a huge volume of questions and generate data on student attempts over four years, being probably the first company to make learning and practicing and testing completely free. So we generated a lot of data. And what we saw was that this interconnected pulsating graph, which was almost like how the brain stores information, was emerging with India's weaknesses. And we saw that there were blocks of red, there were blocks of green and blocks of yellow. And the interconnections finally showed us a way to resolve these blocks, these blockers of knowledge, for multiple levels of students. Because the graph looked different for different types of students. At the same time, we also saw an opportunity to find what paths can be used to resolve these blockers, starting from a student's current strength and ending up on his weakness in the right way. There is no end to this personalization. You might see that a particular type of video presented to a child, once you identify that block, works better than another type of video. There's a video where a teacher's face is shown. There's a video where there's only text shown. Depending upon the level of EQ of the child, he may not want to see the face of the teacher, right? It's just an example sort of drawing upon the previous talk, right? So what we saw was that it was incredibly possible, depending upon the student's learning goal, to design powerful learning recommendations from this graph that either helped you game the system and learn what's important for the exam in the most efficient way, or actually store this knowledge forever so you could create powerful custom paths to learn the content that matters the most to you and make sure that you're resolving every blocker along the way. This was the knowledge graph. The second idea has actually got to do with the irrelevance of learning. What we saw was when we took statistical parameters on knowledge and regressed them on score, there was actually a gap of 40%. We were like, wow, what else could possibly matter? And what came back was not a surprise, but probably it was the first time in the world where it had been statistically verified by data and it continuously grows as a model. The answer was grit and smart test taking. Grit or the sheer force of wanting to try and smart test taking, which is basically being a great examinee, all at the same level of knowledge. What's very interesting is that this particular fact or this blind spot, because no assessment measures it effectively, is the single biggest originator of the statement, I knew it, but I just couldn't do it in the exam. It is also what originates the fear of failure in the test or exam psychosis, because when you prep and you go into a paper and you're not able to perform to the level that you want to or the level that you've prepared, you hit a wall. Flatlining scores create demotivation. When they create demotivation, the student cannot respond because there is no way to know how to respond. So what do they do? They react, they disengage, they get demotivated again, take a step back and said, you know what, I'm giving up. The worst thing that happens is you get labeled. If this hit of confidence is visceral enough, it can also go ahead, extend itself, and viscerally impact life outcomes. The interesting thing is that we've actually seen two to 300% improvement for the toughest exam in the world on base scores just by touching these parameters and not learning anything. So what does that tell you about our examination system? Right? Does it really truly reflect the potential of a student? But you know what? You could call the world dystopian or utopian. We are where we are, and I think it's important to be practical. So the point is, you're standing here, and now you can improve your score by 200%. Nothing succeeds like success. And for a demotivated, checked out, unable to focus student, there is nothing like the panacea of, hey, I can suddenly move my grade up, and I can see it happen within the space of a day. Let's take a few examples. So one example is a student, let's call him Hari. Okay. Hari came to us in 2014. That's when we were just in the data collection hypothesis stage. And he said, you know what, I'm not able to cross a score of 20%. And his parents said he keeps sitting with the books all day, but he's not able to score. So we said, okay, let's figure out what our analytics say. We saw the analytics, we realized that Hari was obviously exper experiencing a lack of knowledge, it was not adequate, but what we also saw was he had low stamina. And that low stamina meant that he could not sit for three hours in the exam and actually make sure that he gives his best. Because of that, he was also not going deep in every question he attempted, and he was making sure that he was attempting, but the attempt was actually a fluke. So as a result of that, his scores were low. Because that gap was detected, it could be actioned. And when he acted on it, 
There were two, year, two days of marathon test taking where the only metric we focused on was stamina and flukes. Just by doing that, he added another 10% to his score within two days. And this was four days before the actual exam when teachers basically shut down their shutters and say, you know, it's all up to you and God now, right? So what does this mean? This means that AI may not be the most emotionally intelligent thing, but if you can parameterize behavior, we're looking at the dawn of a new era in learning science, where behavioral interventions that actually work could move up education outcomes. If you look at the multiple personalities that exist, there is no end to the levels of interventions and detection that you can do. So many cohorts can be formed, and it's impossible to do this without machine learning. And I feel like in a, in a space like India, this is especially a sector that welcomes technology interventions, provided we skirt the delicate issue of making sure we create teacher buy-in in the classroom. Let me give you another example. There was a student, you know, let's call him, I don't know, Batman, right? So Batman took a paper, and when he took a paper, we realized that he was not performing as high as he possibly could have, and he was actually in the high 200s out of 360, which means that he was potentially a very, very good student in terms of his knowledge levels. So what we realized with Batman was, his problem was first look accuracy. What is first look accuracy? If you think about taking a paper, there are always some questions which are within easy reach, and there are some questions you can get on a good day. What is the difference between the two? It's your mindset. That's where the fourth subject comes into play, which is psychology. <laughs> okay. So when you actually end up doing those questions first, that you have mastery on, and you carefully choose those questions, the first time you look at the paper, it sends you on a high in terms of confidence. If your first look accuracy is high, chances are you will get those questions that you would only have gotten on a good day because it becomes a good day for you in the paper. We've realized over a period of time that collecting this tangible data, like first look accuracy, careless mistakes, and whatnot, along with these learning recommendations and data on the knowledge graph, can create intangibles like success, like confidence, like life outcomes for students. Take the example of a student from Gujarat who went from a score of 14% to 41% within the space of a day, combining the impact of these two ideas in the way he took his test and improved. His teachers were pleasantly surprised at the soaring test scores they saw even on physical pen and paper tests later on because he now was suddenly more confident. And they were pleasantly absolutely so happy and delighted at the level of energy that, they, that he then brought into the classroom. Remember, this was a student at 14% who had pretty much been written off by our system. So what does this mean for the future? Measuring intent is the single biggest X factor, the ability to record it and record it in a way that it can be influenced in measuring education outcomes today. Just getting this right and introducing this in assessments globally would put us in a position where we'll actually end up seeing education outcomes multiply for all the students that are involved. We will also see the true gaps in the learning graph because if you get it wrong, it doesn't necessarily mean you don't know it. It's just that we don't know that's the reason. The most exciting thing for me is that maybe over 15, 16 years of learning data, when it's all connected into one coherent graph, and you actually see the interconnections and the data continuum of education for the first time, maybe, just maybe, it's possible for a student to love learning everything because you catch the first sense of distaste, distaste with your behavioral measurement and then address it with the world's best content resources, which could be tagged to this graph through AI, another problem that we're working on, but not relevant for this discussion. Maybe it's possible to actually remove labels from the education world and do it in a way where learning and scoring is balanced. I'm very excited about the future. We're straddling a changing world. Some of us have never heard of these tools. You know, some of us look at it and say, I wish I had this when I was preparing for my exams, or even when I was in sixth grade, seventh grade. Some of us are seeing the stages of that emerge on the horizon. A lot of you, you know, guys might have children you know, who, are in, who are doing some or the other technology tool in the classroom. And maybe future generations will take these tools for granted. But whatever be the case, I'm extremely passionate about the fact that whatever solutions are being built using AI, data science, technology, and content have to straddle the changing world and not just be built for a utopian future where there's a controlled environment and you can only do things right if you start a certain way. 
It has to be inclusive. No child can be left behind, and no child should be labeled. Thank you.